Okay, yeah. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to By His Blood Ministries Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, just like we do each and every week, I'm going to get on here and I'm going to like and share the fact that we are able to to get together and study God's Word. There it is. Okay. All right. Well, I pray that everyone has had a good day and a uh, good week so far. It's early in the week, about midway, so... Um, I pray that everyone's doing well, and uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to come together and gather and to study your holy word, Lord. Lord, as we go through scripture, we look and we see that you have intentionally shown us the way to do things, Lord, because you want us to be set apart and you want us to be made holy, Lord. May we, may we take that seriously and may we understand that we are to be different than the world. May we look at the, the things that are put before us and always put you first, Lord. May we look at life through the scope of, uh, of Scripture the way that you have asked us to, Lord. Lord, we pray that, uh, that, that as we gather and as we meet, we pray that each and every person is made more, more whole. We pray that each and every person is, is drawn closer to you, Lord, and we pray that each household is blessed mightily, Lord. Lord, protect us. Look over each and every one of us, Lord. Let us go through and take the things that we learned today and apply them to our lives so that we may be more successful in all things and give you the glory that you have earned and the glory that is yours. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. All right. Well, um, as far as this week goes, we uh, we don't have a whole lot going on until Sunday. Uh, Sunday we have service at eleven o'clock. It will be at the church, uh, ten fourteen Antioch Road, Johnson City, Tennessee, and uh, we had a, a great service this past weekend. I pray that we continue to uh, to grow and to build from that. Um, it's always good to see our brothers and sisters in Christ and spend time together. So uh, please come join us if you haven't. And if you, uh, if you were there and you, you are a regular, please come and, uh, and uh, spend time with your, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, then uh, Monday, we'll have Man of Monday at the church also uh, at 7 p.m., and then next Wednesday, we'll be right back here for Bible study. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we had uh, discussed a little bit yesterday morning was um, as opposed to doing, uh, excuse me, as opposed to doing the laundry <laughs> ministry, um, every other Saturday, um, and really just, uh, just, pigeonholing ourselves into a, a single ministry such as the laundry ministry. Um, once a month we're going to do a service day where um, you the people get to decide you know what it is that uh, that, that we do. Um, keep your eyes open for situations to be able to serve and uh, and let us know and uh, we will we will help you do what's passionate to you and that way that way we get a broader spectrum of people that we can help we also get to uh, to do things that are close to your hearts and uh, and and who knows I mean some of these things may turn into individual ministries that, uh, that go well beyond just a service day um, so I think that it's a, a good opportunity for each and every one of us to serve and to be on the lookout for ways that we can serve intentionally. So, um, other than that, have I forgotten anything? I think you got it. All right. And the service Saturdays was Nikki's idea, not mine. So You better she, come up with a name for that. Yeah, service Saturday, you know, no. it's okay, <laughs> but yeah, we do need a better name. Y'all need to be thinking of a name for it, too. Um, um, I don't know. I don't know. But right now, it will just be service Saturday until then. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So we are in, the, in Leviticus, and we are still in chapter 6. Um, chapter 6 of Leviticus, um, the way of the Levites. And uh, so just to, to get ourselves in the proper mindset and the proper context, um, we have been going over the different types of sacrifice and we have been going over um, the reasons for sacrifice and we have been going over um, how this scripture pertains to our lives today and um, we see that it all ties to who God is and what God is and who we are and what we are and how to worship properly and how to properly properly honor God with our word, action, and deeds. And we see that even though Jesus has fulfilled the, uh, the ceremonial law, we see that the ceremonial law still carries um, many lessons that we can carry with us today and keeps us um, and is still very relevant in our lives today. So um, we look at the reasoning behind it and we look at, uh, look at the whys and the hows um, you know, Israel coming into a new land, coming into a new place, um, is to be set apart, is to be different than the rest of the world. And uh, God has, uh, has set up the, the sacrificial system, has set up the, uh, the ways in which they are to worship and to honor him to be different than those of all the other uh, tribes and all the other nations and all the other people that surround them. So, um, Israel is, is different and Israel is set apart. God wants Israel to be holy. And, and, and the holiness of Israel is important to God because of his holiness. Um, he is the one true God. There is no other God. So, so he is set apart and he wants his people to be set apart in, in like. So as we get into Leviticus chapter 6, um, we, uh, we get into... Um, we get into a, a, a sacrifice, uh, a guilt sacrifice, and then we are going to see um, all the different offerings and we're going to see the priests and, and their, um, their responsibility in those. Now again, we have our charts of the Old Testament. If, uh, if you purchased one, it's a good time to use it because... Uh, all of this stuff is laid out for us. But I want to open up and uh, I want to take this, this, this chapter, I'm going to take it in sections. The first section is going to be Leviticus chapter 6, starting with verse 1 through verse 7. And, uh, and it begins, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor." In a matter of deposit or security, or through robbery, or if he has oppressed his neighbor, or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of all the things that people may do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt, and will restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by oppression, or the deposit that was committed to him, or the lost thing that he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, that he will restore it in full and add a fifth, and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest his compensation to the Lord, a ram without blemish, out of the flock or its equivalent. For a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall be forgiven any of the things that one may do and thereby be found guilty. And thereby become guilty. I'm sorry. Become guilty, be find, found guilty. So, Right here, we are seeing some, some, some very specific principles and some very specific ways of the Lord come to light. 
and we're seeing some some things come to light that uh, that that are unchanging in the Lord. Um, the first one that uh, that is interesting is the words breach of faith. So I apologize. Uh, is breach of faith. So a breach of faith would be a a a a going against one's faith or a, a going against uh, the Lord. Um, and, you know, we have seen that, uh, that thus far the sins have always been um, sins that were committed against the Lord specifically or sins that were um, as society as a whole. But this is specifically about your neighbor. Now, as we get into the New Testament, we see the parable of the of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the Samaritans were were, were not uh, liked by the Jews. Uh, the Samaritans were considered to be half breeds. The Samaritans were um, shunned, um, though the the Samaritans did share a common lineage through Abraham. Um, they were smited by the Jews. And as we get into the scripture, we see Jesus tell a parable of a, of a man who has fallen, a man who is injured, and uh, he is passed up by a Jewish citizen, he is passed up by a priest, and the Samaritan is the one that takes care of him. The Samaritan is the one that makes sure that he is taken care of. The Samaritan is the one that pays for his, his lodging. The Samaritan is the one that nurses him back to health. And the Samaritan does this in a way that is unselfish, and the Samaritan does this in a way that is glorifying to God. And we see that our neighbor is not always what we think our neighbor looks like. Our neighbor is not always someone that looks just like us. Our neighbor is not always someone who, who we think maybe believes like us. Our, our neighbor is not always someone who is identical to what we would call a friend. Our neighbor is someone that, that is, it, it goes well outside of just our little circle. So, so what, it, what it's saying is, when you sin against your neighbor, when you sin against God's people, when you sin against an individual, it is not only a sin against that individual, but it is a breach of faith with God. So we can take neighbor in that broad context and we can see that when we commit sin against our our, 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 our community, or when we, we sin against uh, an individual, we see that it is a, a breach of our faith against God. And why would he say that it is a breach? Well, no, number one, it's not following the commandments in which God has given, which is love your neighbor with all your heart, all your might. You love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. See, I used the Good Samaritan story when I also talked about that same commandment earlier when we were when we were in Exodus. The commandment of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. You're in breach of that when you sin against your neighbor. Now, in, in what way? Well, when you when you when you do it in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery or if you have oppressed a neighbor or found something is lost and lied about it, swearing falsely in any of these things that people do to sin thereby. So in anything, in any matter of dishonesty, in any matter of, of trickery, in any matter of deception, if you are deceiving your neighbor in any way, you are in breach of faith against God. Now, you see, you look at that and you're like, okay, well, obviously, I'm in violation of that commandment. I'm in violation of the second of the greatest commandments. But the other thing that you are doing is the reason that it is a breach of faith is because you are lacking the faith that God will give you those good things in due time yourself. If you go out and you commit those breaches that it is talking about, if you go out and you are deceitful, if you find something that is lost and lie about it, if you swear falsely, or if you, if you oppress a neighbor, if you do any of these things, you don't believe that God is going to give you the good things that he is, you are, uh, 
that he has promised you. You are trying to jump ahead of the blessings in which God is giving you. Therefore, you are demonstrating a lack of faith against God himself. So we see that that, that is the first part of it. The first part is that anytime we sin against man, it is not just us sinning against man. It is us sinning against God because we are in violation of those two things. We are not loving the way that we should, and we are not honoring the way that we should. We are not loving, and we are not being faithful. So we are not loving, and we are not honoring God as we should. The next thing that we see is in verse 4, where it says, If he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery. So the, the next thing that we see is we see that he, he must, must realize that he did wrong. This is something that, uh, that we have talked about over and over again, almost to nauseam. But the, the, the thing is, in order for someone to be repentant for something, in order for someone to, to say that they are sorry for something, they must first understand that they have done wrong. Now, how is it that someone understands that they have done wrong? Well, we, we do have an ingrained set of morals that we, we live by. God has given each of us a moral code, but we have adjusted that code to where we can justify or we can, we can, we can manipulate any situation to make it feel like it is not wrong. So the first thing that we have to do to to realize that we have done wrong is we have to get back down to that initial moral code and we have to say, okay, I have done wrong. And we have to to realize that so that we can admit guilt. We we must realize that we have done wrong before we can can admit the guilt of doing wrong. So in order for us to to truly be repentant, we have to know that we have done wrong. Um, how does that happen? Sometimes we do that on our own. Sometimes we do realize on our own, hey, I've messed up here and I am sorry. Other times people have to bring it to our attention. And when they bring it to our attention, we have to realize that we have done wrong. Does that mean that we, um, that we, we, we immediately, um, understand the principles behind that? No, a lot of times there's teaching that has to be involved so that we can, we can show them, okay, this is the reason that you're wrong. Just telling someone that they're wrong does not really accomplish a whole lot. Uh, a lot of times it takes the, the, the instruction that goes along with it. So, so the, reali- the, the realization of, of a wrong, um, sometimes it, it takes time. And that's why, God, that's why God's word is telling us, it says, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt. Okay, so... Once he has sinned and realized his guilt, then it's time to do something about it. Now, this is interesting. Because it says that he shall shall restore him full and add a fifth. So he's going to give back what it is that he has taken. And he is going to give restitution. So for the trouble that I have caused you, here is everything that I have given you. Plus a fifth. Hopefully this will cover your heartache. Hopefully this will cover your, your torment. Hopefully this will cover the trouble. And, and here is what I owe you plus some. And it says that he is to give it to whom it belongs on the day that he realizes his guilt. So God understands people more than we understand ourselves. See, the, 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 the time in which to, to give and the time in which to, to give the apology, the time in which to give the, the compensation for what was taken, is not a month or two down the road. It is when you realize your guilt. Now, God is doing that so that, that we, are, we remain in good standing, that we balance out correctly. But also, he is doing it you think that he would he would be doing that for the person that was sinned against. But if you look at look at yourself and you look into the world, you see that it is also for the one who has sinned. Because if we realize that we are guilty, we realize that we have committed that sin and we carry that with us without taking without without a, giving that burden over and making that amends the way that we should, we carry that with us. 
And it affects the rest of our behavior, it affects the rest of our relationships, and it affects the, the way that we, we function within God's kingdom. So, so God wants us to, to unburden ourselves with our sin, not later on down the road, not after we try to figure out how to do it ourselves, not after we try how, different ways of doing it. When we realize that we have done wrong, we are to give that back. We are to give what it is back. And they were to add a fifth. Now, again, this, this bleeds into um, the civil law. The civil laws that bind us today, or may, they may be different, but the, 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 the principle that we live by is the same. If you do wrong, when you realize that you have done wrong, that is when you own up to it. When it is brought to your attention that you have done wrong, that is when you, you, you give the compensation. And that compensation can come in many different ways. Compensation can be monetarily. Compensation can be um, in, by way of an apology. Compensation can be some type of amends. And you give it to the one with, to whom it belongs. So you give it to the one that you have wronged. You give it to the one that you have hurt. You give it to the one that you have taken from. And then also, in verse 6, it says, And he shall bring to the priest his compensation to the Lord, a ram without blemish, out of the flock, or its equivalent, for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven of any of the things that one may do, and therefore become and thereby become guilty. So, to close out right here, this first section right here, what we see is we see that they bring what is appropriate to atone for the sin that they have committed, a ram or its equivalent, and they bring that to the priest, and the priest offers that to the Lord, to make atonement for their sin. Now when they bring their offering, what they are also bringing is they are bringing their repentant heart. And they are, they are bringing their, 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 their desire to be forgiven by the Lord. And they are bringing all of that to the altar. And that sacrifice is made. And it, says, it does not say, and he, sh he, he might be forgiven. It doesn't say, if the Lord is having a good day, he will be forgiven. It doesn't say, if the Lord is feeling generous, he will be forgiven. It says that he will be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. If we want to roll this into a modern context, and we look at the sacrifice that was made on our behalf through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled the obligation of bringing the ram to the altar so that we would not have to do that. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he was the sacrifice for our sin. So he is the sacrifice for our sin that makes atonement with the Lord. But we still have to come with a repentant heart in order to make that sacrifice valid. And the other part of that is we still we still have an obligation to each other to make atonement for our sins. So when we have wronged each other, Jesus Christ did fulfill the bringing of the ram to the altar. Did fulfill the bringing of the ram to the, to the priest to be made of the sacrifice. However, Jesus Christ, Lord, still expects us 
to come to those that we have hurt, to come to those that we have deceived, to come to those that we have taken from, and to come with a repentant heart to them as well, and to make amends. What does the amends look like? That is between us and the ones that we have sinned against. Because a lot of times, if we have taken objects or if we have taken, um, if we have taken something of the physical, we don't know of the mental and the emotional that comes with it. But uh, but we are to atone, and we are also to forgive each other as that comes. Because notice that, that he says he is to restore in full and to add a fifth. The person who was sinned against is to receive that as well. And if we are to forgive the way that the Lord forgives, when we receive those, uh, whatever it may be to, to atone for that, whether it be an apology, whether it be a, a, a compensation of some sort, whatever it may be, when we receive that apology or when we receive that compensation, we are to forgive as the Lord forgives. See, the, the, the scripture says that as we do these things and they bring that ram, that the Lord will, be, will forgive any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. So if there is something that the Lord will forgive, yet we will not, we are putting ourselves in that place of godness. Yeah, the Lord may have forgiven you, but I'm not going to. Believe me, I get it. I get it. There's things that we say are unforgivable. There is nothing that is unforgivable. There are things that we are unwilling to forgive. There are things that we put into a standard, but the Lord will forgive all things. And who are we to put ourselves above the Lord? Again, we're carrying unneeded burden when we don't forgive those that are seeking our forgiveness. Now, does that mean that we have to restore that person to right where they were in our lives before and we have to say, okay, you're forgiven? No, no, no. We don't have to ever see that person again if we don't want to. We don't have to hang out with that person. We don't have to, we don't have to do any of that stuff, but we are to forgive. We are to forgive. So, the next section is all about the priest and the different types of offerings. Now, I'm going to go to our handy-dandy charts here. If I remember correctly, it's on pages uh, 22 and 23. And uh, we're going to look at the, sacrif the sacrificial system. Um, first, uh, we've got the burnt offering. Uh, all of the burnt offering is burnt. So there is not... There is not just part of the burnt offering uh, that is offered. It is all of it. There's no other portion that is left over. Uh, the animals that are used in the burnt offering, these are males without blemish. Animal according to wealth. So there, there, is, no, there is no one that is excluded from the burnt offering. You give as you can give, but all of it is given. And this is Appropriation for general sin and demonstrates dedication. So for a general sin to, 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 uh, to make up for a general sin, this is what is given and it demonstrates dedication. A meal offering or a tribute offering is a token portion. So just part of it is given. The remainder is eaten by a priest. Um, it is unleavened cakes or grains, and they must be salted. Remember, we talked about the, 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 the symbolic uh, importance of salt and, uh, and how it is a, a, a preservation of the, the covenant made with the Lord. Um, and we also talked about the importance of leaven, leaving the leaven out or leaving, um, leaving sugar out. Because of what it can do, it can ferment, and it can um, it, by, it it demonstrates a, a a breaking of the covenant. And this is a general thankfulness for the first fruits. So this is a first fruits um, 
This would be similar to the tithe that we give. Um, a peace offering, a thank offering, a vow offering, or a free will offering. Um, the fat portions of the animal are burnt. Um, and uh, the, the portions that are remain, are they, they are shared in fellowship meal by priest and offerer. So those who offer it and the priest, they share in this together. It may be a male or a female without blemish according to wealth, free will, slight blemish is allowed. So a slightly blemished animal is allowed in a peace offering. Occasion would be fellowship for an unexpected blessing. For deliverance when a vow was made on that condition. Or for general thankfulness. The sin offering is a mandatory offering. The fatty portions are, are, are burnt. The remainder is eaten by the priest. Um, the animals um, by the priest or the congregation is a bull. Um, the offering for a king is a he-goat, and for an individual it is a she-goat. And it applies basically to a situation where purification is needed. So that is when someone has been made unpure in some shape, manner, or form. That is when that offering is given. The guilt offering, again, is the fat portions. The remainder is eaten by the priest, and it is a ram without blemish. And it applies to a situation where there has been a... A, a, a desecration of something holy or where uh, there is objective guilt. So objective guilt. And um, not subjective guilt, but objective guilt. Definite guilt. So we see the different reasons and the different types of offerings. And now the Lord is going to command how these, uh, how these are to be carried out by the priest. And in verse 8, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the, on the hearth of the altar all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his, his linen garment and put on his linen undergarment on his body. And shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off the garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings the fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. So we see here, we see the specific instruction for the priest. And we see that, that they are to put on their holy garments. They are to go and they are to be presented. They are to present themselves in an appropriate manner to the Lord. And then when they go outside, of the of the of the tabernacle, they are to change their garments and they are to take the ashes to a place that are clean. So so not only is is the is the offering given in a holy place, the, the even the remains of the offering are to be taken to a clean place and disposed of. They're not to be put into a waste pile. They are to be put into a clean place. So we see that this offering we see that, that all of it is to remain holy and to remain set apart. Otherwise, it would say just take the ashes and dump it wherever it may be. Um, and we can see that uh, the, it, it, as, far as, as far as how we deal with the things that we do, when we come to, to the Lord, let's look again at the specifics of this. It is appropriation for, for general sin. And it demonstrates dedication. So when we present ourselves to the Lord, when we are asking forgiveness of sin, or when we are, when we are in general worship, we should present ourselves in a manner that is appropriate. We are to appropriately worship and appropriately honor the Lord in accordance with our, our reverence and our respect for Him. So um, 
though we we don't we don't burn an actual sacrifice when we come and we bring our sacrifice to the Lord, we are still to do so in a in a way that is reverent, in a way that is proper, in a way that is uh, that is 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 demonstrates the love that we have for Him and the honor that we have for Him in our hearts. Verse 14 reads, And this is the law of the grain offering. And the sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. And one shall take from it a handful of fine flour, the grain offering and its oil, and all the frankincense that is on the grain offering. And burn this as a memorial proportion on the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it Aaron and his sons shall eat. It shall be eaten uh, unleavened in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting they shall eat it it shall not be baked with leaven I have given it as a portion of my food offerings it is a thing most holy like the sin offering and guilt offering every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it it is decreed forever throughout your generations from the Lord's food offerings whatever touches them shall become Holy. Okay, so we see that this is the grain offering, and this is the offering um, that is, is, is given. And uh, what we see is we see that the Lord has given a portion of it to the priest. And that the priests are to, to take this, this portion that is given to them, and they are to take it to a place that is holy, and that is where they are to consume it. And the Lord has, has said at the very end, every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it, as decreed forever throughout your generations from the Lord's food offerings. Whatever touches them shall become holy. So whatever touches, whatever touches them is, is set apart, is special, is made holy. And all of Aaron's sons and all of Aaron's family, all of the Levites, they are able to partake of these. Why? Because when they when they go into the new land, when they go into to their, their new place, remember the Levites did not get a specific land. The rest of the land was divided up among the tribes. Yet the tribe of Levi was given the 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 outside of each tribe's area for pasture lands. Yet they did not have a place. So this is their portion and the Lord's offering to them. And they are to treat it with reverence. And they are to treat it as something special that has been given to them for the Lord. Just as we are to take the blessings that we are given. And we are to treat them with reverence. And we are to treat them as something that has been given to us by the Lord. So again, we can draw some parallels because through... The blood of Jesus Christ, every man has become a priest. You are a priest. You bring your you bring your own sacrifices to the Lord. You do not have to go through the inter intermediary. And you receive your own blessings from the Lord. And you receive your own gifts from the Lord. And you are to treat those things as holy. And you are to take them to holy places. Your home is to be a holy place. Your, your, your car is to be a holy place. Your place of business is to be a holy place. Wherever you go, because you have been made holy, you are to make that place holy. Think about that. And it's not you that's making it holy. It is the Lord that dwells within you. So just like the descendants of Aaron, you are to treat the blessings that you receive with reverence and to, to, to treat them with honor. Then in verse 19, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This is the offering that Aaron and his son shall offer the Lord on the day when he is anointed. So the day that Aaron and, 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 and his descendants are anointed and made priests, this is what that they this is what they are going to give to the Lord as thanks for being allowed to be priests. Of the God Most High. A tenth of an ephah of fine flour. As a regular grain offering. Half of it in the morning and half in the evening. It shall be made with oil on a griddle. 
You shall bring it well mixed, baked in pieces like a grain offering, and offer it for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest from among Aaron's sons who is anointed to succeed him shall offer it to the Lord as decreed forever. The whole of it shall be burned. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. So, in a majority of these, these offerings, we have seen that Aaron and, and, and the priest get a portion of it. We, we see that. We see that it is, uh, you know, Scripture says it is, it is a most holy portion, or it says it is to be taken to a holy place. It is to say that this is their, their proportion of the Lord forever. But in this instance, why do you think that Aaron and his sons don't get to eat a portion of what is being offered? It's their sacrifice. Aaron and his sons don't get to partake of their own sacrifice because it, because it is what they are giving the Lord to show the thanks for what they have been given. So, so their portion is being given to the Lord. They're not getting a return portion of what they are given. The, 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 the portions that they get from the other sacrifices, the other blessings that they receive, that is the portion that they, they receive but they don't get a portion of this one because this is their sacrifice. As we move on to uh, verse 24, we see the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his son saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In a place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for a sin shall eat it. So again, we see that here we go. The priest who offers it for a sin shall eat it. So the priest, for his work and for his part of the sacrifice, he is getting his portion. The Lord receives his portion. The priest receives his portion. In the example given before, the priest was giving his portion. Therefore, he did not get a portion out. In a holy place, it shall be eaten in the court of the tent of the meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall be holy. And when any of its blood is splashed on a garment, you shall wash that on which it was splashed in a holy place. So even if during this 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 uh, this ceremony, this uh, the ceremony of sacrifice, if you are a bystander, if you are the one that is uh, that is making the sacrifice, and you get this blood spilled upon you, you don't just throw it in your general laundry. Is to be taken to a place that is holy and to be washed. Because no portion of this sacrifice is to be taken to a place that is unclean, that is not holy. So it is not to be washed with your regular garments. It is not to be washed with, with, the, with the regular laundry. It is to be taken to a special place because it is not to touch something that is unholy. And it says, And the earthenware vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. So this, this offering, once it is made, even the vessel is to be broken because the vessel is not to touch anything else. And if it is a metal portion, or a portion, if it is a metal vessel, if it is a bronze vessel, it shall be scorned and rinsed in water, which makes it useless. You can't scorn it and, and rinse it in water and then have it. Um, it that, that, that portion, that, that, that part will never be in that vessel again. So... So any portion that is uh, that remains is to be disposed of and disposed of properly. And it says, every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no sin offering shall be eaten from which any blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place. It shall be burned up with fire. So the portion that is the Lord's is to be burnt up with fire. And the portion that is, is left to the priest is to be taken to the priest. So the priest is not to take from the Lord's portion. Now later on in scripture we will see that this is a big no-no that several uh, priests commit. They take the portion that is the Lord's that is not theirs and, um, and they will suffer the consequence. But we see, again, specific instruction for the priest for all of this stuff. Now 
Why is all why is specific instruction given to the priest? Because the priests are to be examples to the people of Israel. And they are to follow that specific instruction. And Israel is to follow the specific instructions that they are given as well. So that brings us to the end of this portion of Scripture. That brings us to the end of Leviticus 6. And next week we'll be on Leviticus 7. But before we roll into Leviticus 7, um, I would like to ask if there are any questions about 1 through 6. Anything that we have read or anything in the sacrificial system that we have questions about. Because before we get into the next part, I want to make sure that we're answering questions. I don't see any questions popping up. Um, you know, one of the questions that uh, that I've heard before is, you know, why is it that, 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 you know, that God did this and then we went away from this? You know, there's always a purpose for the things that God does. And, um, you know, as we read through this and we see how man reacted to the way that they were supposed to respond to the to the sins in which they committed, we see that man failed miserably at this. and um, But we also see that all of this is centered around a heart condition. This is all centered around where your heart is and, 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 how, um, and how you obey the Lord. So the, 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 the system was, uh, was, was, was given and it was put out there and we see we see throughout history, we see that, uh, that man did a poor job of it. But we also see that God did what he said he would do. God always forgave and God always restored and God always brought, uh, brought peace. And he always had Israel in his heart. So we see that, uh, that any of the violations in this system were made by man. Therefore, the atonement of Jesus Christ was necessary because of man's disobedience. And because of man's failure to um, to honor and to worship properly. Um, with that, if we have any questions, concerns, comments, anything of that nature. I see a prayer request. I see Daniel. Daniel, I pray everything's going okay with you. I haven't had a chance to call you today, but I will call you here shortly. Um, well, if we don't have any questions, concerns, comments, or complaints, we will close out in prayer. Deborah says to please pray for uh, her family, to, uh, to pray for Sterling and his mamma, Gary, uh, his, uh, her grandson, her brother Jimmy, he's had, he has surgery tomorrow. The church congregation, as well as myself, Nikki, and baby Sadie. And uh, she says that she loves us all, and we love her too. And uh, Deborah, we pray that you are feeling better. And uh, we pray that the Lord restores you back to health. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. We pray, uh, we pray that you be with uh, Daniel's, uh, Daniel's mom during this time. Uh, I'm not going to get into specifics, but... Uh, but be in prayer for her and for her health. And um, as always, you know, let's be in prayer for the Kimbrough family and for Gary. Um, and uh, let, let's be in prayer for, for all of the churches because all of the churches are going to be opening back up. And let's just pray that this is a time of a, of a great awakening, a time of a coming back to the, to the church and coming back to God and a coming back to, to worship the way that we should. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your holy word, Lord. We thank you for the instruction that you've given us, Lord. May we follow this instruction properly, and may we understand that you've given it to us for a reason, Lord. Lord, you've given us the, 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 the rules, you've given us the regulations, and you've also given us specific examples of successes and failures that have gone on throughout the centuries, Lord. Lord, let us learn from our past. Let us learn from the things that have happened. Let us understand that it is not our job to repeat history over and over over and over again, Lord. It is our job to make a difference, Lord. May we make a difference in this world, and may we be strong, may we be firm, and may we always plant ourselves 
firmly in your roots and the and the, the the nourishing water, the nourishing water that is your holy word. Lord, we thank you for providing these things for us, Lord, and for always giving us a way. And Lord, we, we honor you with our lips, we honor you with our deed, and we honor you with our actions, and we desire to serve, Lord. Point us in the directions that we need to go so that we may do so properly, Lord. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone that is seeking you, anyone that is desiring to know you, Lord, we pray that they cry out to you, Lord, that they profess the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that they understand that Jesus went to the cross for them and that his blood atoned for their sins, not just the sins that they had committed, but the sins that they will commit and the sins that they are committing right now, Lord. Lord, that his blood is perfect. His blood is enough to, to cleanse us over and over and over again, Lord. And Lord, we pray that as we, we are cleansed and as we receive the forgiveness that you've given us, Lord, that we learn our lessons, Lord, and we turn away from the things that hurt us. We turn away from the things that separate us, Lord. We turn away from the things that harm our neighbors, Lord, and that we become the men and women that you desire us to become, Lord. And Lord, we pray that that person realizes that Jesus Christ not only died for them, Lord, but Jesus Christ resurrected for them on the third day. He defeated the grave. He defeated the world. He defeated evil. All the things that we think that we cannot overcome are possible to overcome through Jesus Christ, Lord. But when we step away from him, we can we can, we can can guarantee that we will be defeated, Lord, because we do not have the power to to, to, to accomplish those victories, to, 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 to get over those hurdles, to get through those obstacles without him, Lord. And Lord, he is now risen and he sits on the right hand side of you as our advocate, Lord. And Lord, as an advocate, he speaks on our behalf. He receives our request. He grants our wishes, not as a genie, but as a God who loves, Lord. He will not give until we are until we are in a place where we can receive, Lord. Let us learn these lessons and let us cling to them, Lord. And let us cling to the to the to the things that Jesus Christ has done on our behalf, Lord. And Lord, for those that are coming to know him and those that have come to the knowledge, the life-saving knowledge that those things are true and they are willing to profess them and they are willing to live them, Lord. Lord, thank you for saving them. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for bringing us out of our sin. Thank you for bringing us out of the hells that we've created, Lord, and saving us in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Well, I love y'all. I am looking forward to seeing y'all in person, whether it be uh, tomorrow morning or whether it be uh, Sunday or whether it be somewhere in passing. I look forward to seeing you. I love you and may God bless each and every one of you.